In our lesson today, we're going to be looking at another one of Jesus' parables. This one is found in Matthew chapter 22. Now, as we look at the parables that Jesus gave, we're looking at him using illustrations that relate to everyday life that everyone will be able to understand and use that to describe some spiritual truth. And in this parable, Jesus is describing a king hosting a wedding feast or a marriage feast for his son. And not everyone was going to answer the invitation that was offered on this occasion. Now, as we study this parable, just as we do with all of the parables that we've been looking at over the last several months, we're going to try to identify the main point. Once we know what the main point is of the parable, we can then go and see what applications we can make from this that would apply to our lives today. So we're going to begin by looking at this parable in Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. It says there that Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast. But they were unwilling to come. Again he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. And Jesus goes on and says, The king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But then we have a second part to this parable. Jesus goes on and says, When the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So that's the parable we're looking at here in our lesson today. Now to understand this, we need to look at the context. This parable was given immediately after the parable of the landowner. We talked about this parable a couple months back. That's found at the end of Matthew chapter 21. And as we studied that parable, we saw that the main point of that was that it was a reminder that we are to be working for the Lord in his kingdom. We have a responsibility to him to do his work. This was also during Jesus' final visit to Jerusalem before his arrest and crucifixion. He made his triumphal entry, as it's described at the first part of Matthew chapter 21. The people were praising Jesus as he entered the city. The rulers of the people were indignant over this. They challenged his authority. And so you have two very different reactions to what's going on here with Jesus entering Jerusalem. Jesus gave this parable here to address, at least in part, the way that the rulers were rejecting him and not heeding the invitation to be part of this celebration and this feast and this wedding that is being described here as it relates to the kingdom of heaven. So what's the basic point? What's the main point of this parable? Well, the first part of the parable had to do with an invitation. The king sent out an invitation to all those that he had invited. All the preparations were made. The animals were slaughtered. The, they were prepared. Everything was ready. All that was left for them to do was simply to attend. The king had made all the preparations. They just needed to attend. Yet those who were invited, as we read there in the parable, they rejected the invitation. They refused to come. So the king told his slaves to invite everyone they could find. After dealing with the ones who rejected the invitation, he said, go out and find anyone you can find. And so they did that. And then the hall was filled with guests. Then the second part of the parable addressed the ones who answered the invitation. 
those who attended the wedding feast. One of the ones there was singled out because he was there without wedding garments. He was not properly dressed or properly clothed for that event. And when he was questioned about it, he didn't have an answer. And he was cast out and was not allowed to to stay at that feast. The main point of this parable is that we need to answer the Lord's invitation. And in answering the Lord's invitation, we need to do so appropriately. It's not just enough just to show up. Answer his invitation and do so appropriately. This is summed up in Jesus' statement as he, as he said at the end of the text in verse 14, that many are called, but few are chosen. So as we look at this parable, what's going on here in this parable? You have the king hosting a wedding feast for his son. As Jesus is giving this parable about the kingdom of God, again, this is a spiritual truth that's being represented or illustrated by this parable. So he is referring to the king as being God the Father, the son being Jesus, the son of God. And this wedding feast is being prepared. Well, who is the son of the king, the son of God? Who is he being married to? Well, Paul described the church in Ephesians chapter 5 as the bride of Christ. So that's why he's talking about, well, this is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is related to this. You have God the Father. You have Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. And there is a marriage that's taking place. There's a wedding that's happening. And the bride of the Son, the bride of Christ, is the church. Those who were initially invited, those were the Jews. Over in Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24, while Jesus was here on the earth, he said that I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was the first part of his task, to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Unfortunately, many of them rejected him. In Matthew chapter 23, just the next chapter over from where we're studying this parable, Matthew chapter 23, he addressed the the failings or the sins of the scribes and the Pharisees and their their hypocrisy. But it represented really what those who were rejecting him represented them as a whole. And in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37, Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were unwilling. There were some who followed Jesus. And we sometimes read about, in some places it seems like large numbers, but most people did not follow him. Most of them were either in positions of leadership and they rejected Jesus because he was a threat to them, or they were influenced by those who were their leaders religiously. And so they ignored Jesus or rejected him or just didn't want to have anything to do with him. But most rejected Jesus. And those who rejected Jesus, those who rejected this invitation, just as it was described in the parable, they would be punished for this. They would face that penalty. The next verse, Matthew 23, verse 38, he says, Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. And in the next chapter, in Matthew chapter 24, he describes how that's going to happen. The first half of Matthew chapter 24 is describing the destruction of Jerusalem. That because Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who killed the prophets and stoned those who were sent to her, that Jesus wanted to welcome them. He wanted to save them, but they were unwilling. So their house is being left to them desolate. Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. That's described in detail in the first 35 verses of Matthew chapter 24. Afterward, you have the king saying, well, go out and invite everyone you can find. After the gospel went to the Jews, it would later go to the Gentiles. Paul said in Romans 1 and verse 16 that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first, 
but then also to the Greek or also to the Gentile. When Jesus gave the apostles the Great Commission, he told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation in Mark 16 and verse 15. So it would not be just for the Jews. They were not going to be the only ones invited. This was also for the Gentiles, which for most of us, that's who we are. So this is, this is an invitation that is for us just as much as it was for those Jews in the first century that first heard the gospel. But everyone was going to be welcome to God. When Peter preached to that first Gentile convert in Acts chapter 10, he said in verses 34 and 35 that he understood that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Doesn't matter who we are, doesn't matter where we come from, Jew or Gentile, we fear God, we do what is right, we are welcome to him. The invitation is open to all of us. But then we see in the parable that those who attended, they had certain expectations that were placed upon them. Because that one who didn't have the wedding garments on, he was questioned about that. Now, traditionally, this isn't outlined in the parable, but this would have been understood by those who heard the parable. Traditionally, the wedding garments were provided for the guests by the host. And a couple commentaries have listed there, Albert Barnes, Adam Clark, their commentaries mention the fact that, that this was a custom there. So what this means is that there was no excuse for this one person who did not have a wedding garment, he could have had one. It wasn't that, well, he's too poor to be able to afford his own. No, it would have been provided for him. That's what the host of the feast, what the king there, what he would have provided. But this person, for whatever reason, rejected that, neglected it, whatever it was, he was not wearing that garment that was provided to all of the others. There was no excuse for him not having this. This is a lesson that God expects those who come to him to maintain purity. Over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27, it talks about the relationship between Christ and the church just as a husband and a wife. And it says in Ephesians 5 verse 27 that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. When the church at Corinth had to deal with sin that existed there, there was a person there in the church who was refusing to repent of sin that was not even heard of among the Gentiles. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, Clean out the old leaven, so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sanctified. Therefore let us celebrate the feast not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Our local churches are to be pure and are to be free from sin. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it talks then about us as individuals, that we are to maintain purity. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 7 says, God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. He does not want us to be impure. He has forgiven us of our sins. Those of us who have answered that call have accepted that invitation. We have been purified and cleansed of our sins. Well, he expects us to maintain that and to wear that, that we have these clean garments, that we abstain from sin, we overcome sin. But there would be punishment, as we see in this parable, those who rejected the invitation and those who did not respond appropriately. There would be punishment for both of those groups. They would both be held accountable. So again, the lesson, we need to respond to the Lord's invitation, but do so appropriately. So how do we need to apply this for us today? The first point is that we need to answer the Lord's invitation. Over in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus articulated this invitation and explained what this is and what is involved in it. Matthew chapter 11, at the end of that chapter, he said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, but take my yoke upon you and learn from me that we have to allow him to guide us and to lead us. He is offering this invitation. And as Paul explained in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, that we are called by the gospel. That's how he calls us. He's not appearing to us in dreams. He's not giving us visions or anything like that. He is calling us through the gospel. That's why his invitation there in Matthew chapter 11 is recorded for us and written down so that everyone who opens up their Bible and reads it, sees the Lord's invitation. He is inviting each one of us. We need to answer that call. And we also need to recognize, as we see explained in the parable, that God has made all the preparations that were necessary. He has made everything ready for us to take part of this in this feast. All things are ready. Invite them to come. Titus 2.11 says, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. This is available to everyone. God has done everything that was necessary to make this available. There is nothing to hinder us except our poor attitude toward God and His Word and this invitation that He offers or our lack of faith in Him. When the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, after Philip preached to him, he asked, well, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? He says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. If you believe, if you have faith, if you have faith and you want to please God, you want to do what is right, there is nothing hindering you because God has made everything ready. God has extended this invitation All we have to do is answer it. And so the eunuch, learning what he needed to do to answer that, went down with Philip into the water and he was baptized. He came up rejoicing, knowing that he had done what the Lord called him to do. We also need to understand that there is nothing more important than our response to that invitation. You have in the parable this invitation going out and people were not paying attention. They had other things to do. They went to their farm. They went to their business. They had other things that they were concerned with. We need to understand that there is nothing more important than this invitation. Nothing more important than this salvation that the Lord offers. Paul wrote over in Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 and 8. He said, whatever things were gained to me, Whatever he could have obtained, whatever he could have profited in this life, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Everything of value in this life, he says it is rubbish, it's trash, it's garbage compared to what the Lord offers. There are some important things we need to take care of in this life. Our farms are important. Our businesses are important. If we have those, our work is important. Our family is important. All these things are important. But they're not more important than salvation. They're not more important than pleasing the Lord and doing His will. Nothing is more important than our response to the Lord's call to that invitation to come and be part of this wedding feast. Another point that we see here is that we need to be clothed by the Lord. We've talked, mentioned already what the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8 in responding to the call of the gospel. He said, well, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, well, if you believe, you may. As long as you have faith, there's nothing to hinder you. You have faith. That faith leads you to want to serve God. There's nothing hindering you from being baptized. Well, why were they talking about baptism? Why was there an emphasis on that? This wasn't some ritual that a church was was involved in or some special baptismal service that a church was hosting. They were out in the wilderness. 
why do they stop the chariot and go into the water so Philip could baptize the eunuch? Well, we can start to get an idea of why. There are a lot of passages we can look at, but over in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, this is one passage that explains why that response would have been made, why baptism was so vital and so important. So there are a lot of people that even if they practice baptism, they don't fully understand why it's so important. That they see it just as a you know as something that you do or or just an outward sign or a reminder or of of your salvation or something like that. Scriptures describe it as more than that. Galatians chapter three and verse twenty seven, it says, "For all of you who were baptized into Christ, he says, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. You have in that wedding feast people answering this invitation, coming to the wedding feast, and then you have that one guest." Where are your wedding clothes? Why aren't you clothed the way that you should be clothed? That was available to you. When we are baptized into Christ, we are clothed with Christ. Are we clothed with Christ? Have you been baptized into Christ to be clothed in Christ? If you've been baptized, was it for that reason? Or was there some other reason behind it? We are baptized to be clothed with Christ. We need to be clothed properly to respond properly to this invitation. Over in Colossians chapter 3, there's another way that we way in which we are clothed, we are to be clothed, where he says in Colossians 3, beginning in verse 9, Do not lie to one another. Since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. You put off the old self and you put on the new self. Verse 12, he says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Put off the old man, you put on the new man. And these are the things that are part of that. That love and that those attitudes that he described there beginning in verse 12. You put those things on. You put on Christ in baptism and you put on the new man. That is different from the old man. We need to be clothed by the Lord. Wearing those clothes, figuratively speaking, that he has made available for us. And the final point of application that we need to remember from this parable is the Lord, the Lord will judge all of us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone is going to be judged by the Lord. You will have those who reject him, just as those in the parable, they rejected the invitation. As Paul described in 2 Thessalonians 1, those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel, they refuse to listen. They refuse to obey the gospel. And then you have those who maybe had good intentions, or at least they say they talk that way, but they didn't do the Lord's will. Say in Matthew 7, Jesus talked about those who say, Well, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? And Jesus will answer that, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You who are doing things that you think it's what I want, but it's not in harmony with my law that I've given you, my instructions that I've given you. We need to answer the invitation, do it appropriately. Don't reject him, but instead answer that call and be faithful in answering that call. So as we bring this lesson to a close, as we look at this wedding feast, the Lord has invited us to take part in this marriage feast for his son and his bride, which is the church. Let's not be like those who reject the invitation. 
and say, well, I don't want to have anything to do with it, or I've got better things to do. But let's also not be like those who respond inappropriately and fail to take advantage of the of what the Lord provides. Forgiveness, that we can be clothed with Christ, as we talked about. Where we can set aside the old man and put on the new man. That's available. That's made possible because of the forgiveness of sins and the the path that the Lord has given us, the instruction that he's given us in his word, all that's available to us. So instead of rejecting the invitation or responding in a way that is inappropriate, let's take advantage of that invitation that we are privileged to have been offered to us. Let's take advantage of that invitation. Answer the call of the gospel. Come to the Lord, obey him, and be part of that kingdom and enjoy the blessings that come by being in fellowship with him.